All right, so we're going to finish up our discussion of cells by talking about specialization and transport. All right, once again, here's a little blue, blue phrase up here, which tells me that there is another video that goes with what I'm doing right now. So once again, if you want to stop right now and go find this video, it's called Specialized Cells, Significance and Examples. Um, you can watch that now, or you can come back and watch it at a later time. All right, so cellular specialization in multicellular organisms. There are four different types of bone cells that are needed for growth, maintenance, and repair of your skeleton. All right, you don't need to really know the different types of bone cells. Just understand that there are different cells. They're all bone cells, but they each have different jobs. Some help with growth, some help with fixing when there's a break, et cetera, et cetera. All right, there are three main types of nerve cells. We call those neurons. The first one is a sensory neuron. Second are interneurons. And the third are motor neurons. They all transmit information. A sensory neuron would be an example of um, if you touch something hot, the nerve will send a signal to your brain that that is hot the motor neuron connects to the muscle, which makes you move your hand. You don't have to consciously think, oh, gee, I, you know, I have my hand on a hot pan. I probably ought to take it off before I get too badly burned. Um, th these are automatic things. The, the brain automatically does this for you and makes you move your hand without you really thinking about it. Epithelial cells. They line the surfaces and the cavities of the body, right? And you can see there's different types down here. We've got squamous and cuboidal. We don't need, we're not going to get into all these details of what each of these mean, okay? Just understand that epithelial cells are essentially, their skin cells are good examples. They line the insides of different parts of your body. There are three different types of muscle cells. There's skeletal cells muscle cells, which are also known as striated. Striations are like layers, and you can see the layers in here, okay? There's smooth, oh, by the way, striated, those are used for voluntary movements. That's what you use when you reach over and pick something up, pick up your pencil, do something. You're voluntarily thinking about it and making yourself do that. Then there's the smooth muscle or non-striated, and those are involuntary movements, things that go on inside your body that you don't have to make happen. You don't have to tell your body to digest food once you've eaten it. I mean, it just automatically does it. The muscle moves the food through the system automatically without you doing anything about it. And then there's cardiac muscle, which is the part that's found, or the muscle that's found inside the heart. The word cardiac means heart. Three types of different blood cells. Right? The most numerous that you have in your body are the red blood cells. These are what hold oxygen and carbon dioxide. They bring oxygen to parts of your body and bring carbon dioxide away so you can get rid of it, breathe it back out. Okay. There's platelets, which are teeny tiny little parts and they use for clotting. So if you get a cut, these platelets will swarm to the cut area to build up a, a barrier to keep you from bleeding. It stops the bleeding over time. And then the largest are the white blood cells, and these things fight infection. So again, I'll use the example of getting cut. Um, the platelets rush there, but so do white blood cells. Okay? White blood cells are used to fight off infection because you now have a break in the skin and bacteria and all kinds of things can get into your body. And so the white blood cells help fight that off so you don't get infections. And then the platelets start to clot over so that you will stop bleeding. All right, transport. How do materials get into and out of cells? What types of materials must enter a cell at relatively constant rates? Well, you got to have your body's cells need oxygen and they need energy, food. Those things need to be getting in there so that they can be used for cellular respiration and for life processes. The materials that need to be removed from the cells 
our carbon dioxide and other waste products. Right? So there are things that have to be taken in that you need to live. And then there are things that the body needs to get rid of. Right? And that's what transport is. Transport is moving material, whatever you need, into cells and then moving the things that you don't need out of the cells. All right. And once again, a little blue heading here. So we go to our amoeba sisters and you can see that there is another video on cell transport. Highly recommend you go back and watch this when you get a chance. All right, so how do materials get into and out of cells? Um, there are different types of transport, all right? If you are, if you're moving something from an area where there's not a lot of it to an area where there's already a lot of it, it's harder to get that material into a cell that already has a lot of it in. I use the analogy of a hill. This looks like a little hill here. Okay. If you want to push something up a hill, you have to put in a lot of energy to make that happen. Okay. So if you want to get a material into a cell where there's already a high concentration of that material in there, you have to take, it takes a lot of energy to force that stuff into the cell. Just like it takes a lot of energy to push a, a boulder up a hill. That's called active transport. You're actively doing something, actively pushing something somewhere, actively adding energy in order to make something happen. All right. On the other side of that is what's called passive transport. It's like if you got to the top of that hill with that boulder, and then once you crest the top, you just let go of the boulder and it rolls down to the bottom. All right. You're going from a high area to a low area. All right. If you're trying to get something into a cell that doesn't have a lot of it, it's easier to get it in there. It doesn't take a lot of energy to make that happen. And oftentimes it doesn't take any energy to make that happen. Okay? So again, if you're trying to get material from an area where there's a low concentration of it into an area where there's a high concentration, low to high, that's active transport and you have to input a lot of energy to make that happen. You got to push a boulder up a hill it takes a lot of energy however if you want to get that boulder to the bottom of the hill or you want to get some material into a cell where there's not a lot of it already in that cell that's passive you don't have to do much you give it a little nudge and it goes right because it wants to go in there the ball the, excuse me the boulder wants to go to the bottom of the hill all right active transport requires an input of energy to make it happen passive transport does not require an input of energy to make it happen All right, material moving across a membrane from higher to lower concentration. We have three types of passive transportation. Three types of passive. Diffusion, facilitated diffusion, and osmosis. Notice there is a little video here. Forgot to click on it before, so I will now. Again, I'm not going to play the whole thing, but you can see that there's a video on osmosis. All right. All right, here's a little graphic representation to kind of show you what's going on. All right. If you have a cell and there's a lot of material in it, but there wasn't much out here, it's easier to get it out of the cell. It doesn't require any energy for that stuff to flow out because it, there isn't anything out here taking up space. All right? That's passive. All right? Active is the opposite. Now we're going from a lower concentration area into a higher concentration. And there's three types of active. There's penocytosis, phagocytosis, and exocytosis. Now, we're not even going to get into the – just like back, we go back real quick – Right here, we're not going to talk a lot about the difference between diffusion, facilitated diffusion, and osmosis. Okay, just understand high to low is passive, low to high is active. All right, so let's look at a graph again. We got a cell, there's very little inside the cell, 
but there's a lot outside. That requires a lot of energy to get these guys out here where there's already a lot of them out there. They don't want to go out there because there's already a ton out there. So you got to put in energy. And that energy is in the form of ATP, okay? adenosine triphosphate. That's where cellular respiration comes in. All right, moving the molecules from inside the cell to the outside of the cell requires energy. Since it's using energy, a cell will only do this to take in or eliminate important molecules. It's not gonna, it's not gonna use up a lot of its energy to do something that's not important to it, All right? It's only something that's really, really important for the processing of that cell or for the life skill, life processes of that cell it, it, in order for it to waste that kind of energy to get things to do that, all right? And that's the end of our cell.